Hey there, welcome to Cocktails and Clitature, the podcast that's all about bringing the heat. It's time to talk about the smuttiest and spiciest books in town. And trust me, we're not holding back anything. I'm your host, Constance, and together we're diving head first into a world of litlicious pleasure where we celebrate the power of our inner goddesses and embrace the magic of our curves. Get ready to slay those pages, ladies, because this ain't your grandma's book club, okay? We're breaking down barriers, smashing stereotypes, and owning our sensuality like nobody's business. It's all about empowerment, upliftment, and unapologetic self-love. We've got the inside scoop you don't want to miss. This is Girl Talk at its finest. So gather your bestie, tune in, and let's go on a wild, sassy, and unapologetic ride together. Happy holidays, everyone. Welcome to Cocktails and Clitature. I'm your host, Constance. And I'm your co-host, Amber. And today, we have the amazing Jennifer L. Armantrout, a.k.a. J.L.A. in the house. <laughs> Thank you, guys. For yeah, having no, we're so happy. You have been doing so much this year. New York Times bestselling author. You're rocking the charts as the highest grossing author of 2023. Ooh. And, you know, you're our Beyonce of romanticy. So <laughs> come on. <laughs> isn't that isn't that 100 percent true? <laughs> so, I live for you. I'll, I'll take you. that final. <laughs> I'll get that tattooed on my forehead. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. I know you like tattoos over there. I saw one of your pictures on uh, Instagram today and you had uh, your dog and I saw your little tattoo peeking out. I was like, oh, okay, Jennifer. Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, um, I do have quite a bit of them. So I do the tattoos. I don't find them that painful. However, it's because I'm very strategic in where I get them done. <laughs> like right. I, I know where the no no zones are, where I'm like mm-hmm. that needle set starts getting to the inner. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, nope, I, you got to go down now. You stop, and that's about to hurt. Like holy hell, and I, you know, so but I think for me, it's it's I don't know what it is about tattoos. I'm not like one of those people who, who you know how there are people who do it because they like they, they you know they kind of like the pain. Mm-hmm. That's not me <laughs> at all. I because it, it is irritating feeling. Like, do you guys have tattoos? I have one. I have a matching tattoo with my stepson. Oh, um, that's... yeah. And I got it on my ankle. And I think I might be one of those people that like that yeah. kind of pain. It wasn't like that at all. It was actually relaxing. Yeah. Well, I, you know, yeah. and I think it's because it releases like some sort of endorphins. And so mm-hmm. that why like a lot of times like tattoo artists, like if they're doing like long for a big piece, why they stop at a certain point, because that does wear off. Mm-hmm. And but the only thing I found that is painful is when they go back and some will do shading and like the outline at the same time. But when they do like something and then they go back and do the shading, then that's when you're like, okay, that's starting to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Good to like, know. Yeah. But it really just feels like cat scratch really is what you know, it feels like to be. I don't know about y'all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. Mm-hmm. You gonna do it. No. Nah. I'm a doctor. <laughs> well, on that note, let's get into A Fire in the Flesh. Okay, because this book had me crying, had oh. me laughing, had me getting wet, had me <laughs> all excited because those last few chapters, we got to get into it because, <laughs> we. oh my God. Okay. Anyway, so why don't you let us know the deets on this hot new release? Well, the the third book in the series is, you know, the first one where you actually get to see Colas right on the page. And, you know, you've heard about him. He's been referenced and you did see him for like a brief second in A Light in the Flame, but it was very quick in a way. And You know, I, so the book, approaching the book was difficult because I knew that it was going to require Sarah and Ash to be separated for a time because if I just had her with Colas and then five chapters later reunited, it's kind of like, well, that was anticlimactic. This is supposed to be like one of the big bads, you know, kind of thing. Uh Um, So it was hard, like in the sense of balancing the fact that 
you know, Sarah was going to be dealing with a lot, and she does in this book. Um, you know, she has to deal with Colas, who is very manipulative, and you know, almost has a bit. He, he doesn't have like a dissociative personality disorder or anything like that, but he has, you know, in a way, two sides to him, and he will be kind of like, oh, okay, normal, and 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 I say no, or may not say normal, <laughs> um, you know, way. Um, but then he flips just like that. And there's people, we all have probably unfortunately met people like that, right? Where it's like, you never know what side of this person you're going to get. Yeah. And that's a lot to deal with. And so you have that. And then I had to balance that with, you know, getting, you know, with the reunion and making that reunion pay off, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they and you know, lost time. <laughs> yeah, I hated COVID. I was like, this motherfucker's got to die. <laughs> you know what the funny thing is? It's like, I, I, you know, before it came out, there were some readers that I, that I had seen that were like, um, you know, why do I feel like I'm going to end up like, you know, either lusting after Colas or sympathizing with him? And I'm like, well, let's uh, reevaluate that statement <laughs> Like once mm. you read it. But then I've, yeah. I've seen people afterwards still kind of be like, you know, and it's and I feel like it's okay to feel sorry. It's okay to feel sorry for a bad person, right? We should have yes. empathy. Um, yeah. yeah, and then but there are people obviously that you're not going to have empathy for. But for you know a lot, of, you can empathize for someone, but that doesn't mean you are like I'm going to forgive you or what you've done is okay. But right. I have seen some people still who really it's it's funny because we joke around it's like okay, there is a genre of that. It's called dark romance and um <laughs> that's which is fine but uh in this case it's like get right with jesus because um that is oh because i'll joke with some of the readers too and i'm always like um i, I think you need some therapy maybe some therapy <laughs> yes one of that dark romance yeah. yeah yeah it's yeah, a and lot you, and you know, there's some dark romance that i do enjoy but it's like you have to kind of know if you're getting into that <laughs> like you know you can't you can't expect right. Yeah, you're gonna you're, you're gonna have a shock of your life if you're not realizing you're reading that. But yeah, it, so yeah, yes. Sierra does go through a lot, and things are revealed in the book with you know things that even in some extent you know hint towards what is to come in the Blood and Ash series. Yes. Oh yes. my God. Ah, I want to know. I want to know. Okay, Amber, go ahead with that drink we got going on today because okay, I'm ready. Yes. We've, we've given you guys a nice little teaser of what's going on in this book. But, but you know, cocktails and literature, we have to have a drink of the day. And we were thinking what honors this series. And we came up with an old fashioned cocktail. We wanted it to be old yet smoky, like the sexiness that Ash is. So, Clean, clean, and Weird. if you're drinking something else or not a cocktail, whatever works for you. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Jennifer, it's time for our game. Reveal your flesh or jump in the fire. So it's time to get spicy. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. What is your guilty pleasure romance troupe? Enemies to lovers. Mm. Same. Yeah. 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 There's so much room to play with. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you have banter. That's where you get the whole the great like i hate you but i want you i mean i think it builds up a lot of tension and chemistry so those are always yeah, yeah i love that then your books are all about that so why wouldn't i um okay what's the sexiest book you've ever read i would have to say one of the hot like steamiest books i've read is uh <laughs> laura lay's um august brothers <laughs> mm, i, I say um taboo love okay. the taboo and yes it's definitely like it's one of those books i many years ago i heard them talk about on twitter and you know and i was like okay like i have to read this because i have to see if it's you know what you just because most of the people are like because it's about brothers who share and some people are like you know oh mm -hmm. but how hot can that be because you know oh, could definitely be touching there so I was like, I'm going to read it. And then I was like, oh, wow. I, why do I now not have a problem with this? <laughs> like, <laughs> And in the real world, I would have been like, um. We're all there with you on that. Yeah, all but it, it, yeah, 
It is. It, 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 I think there were like three books that were out, and they probably, like I said, are the steamiest. But all, if you've ever read Laura Lay, all her books are very sexy, very steamy. Good to know. Okay. Add that to my little part. Same, Amber. Are you taking notes because that one? Yeah. Got to read that. <laughs> mm, got a pen, red. Okay, let's go over there, Jennifer, with that vape pen. Mm-hmm. Get it, girl. Let's let's cheers to that. Amber. You drinking? Let's take a little sip. Okay. Would you rather be pleasure bitten by vampire or get cozy with a shifter in all their naughty forms? <laughs> I would probably have to say um, uh, pleasure bitten by vampire. I feel like if it was a shifter and they were in their like cuddly form, I would just be like, oh, I want to pet them and then like go to sleep. And I'm a sucker, at you. Yo, I'm a sucker for a centaur. <laughs> Half so I man, sleep. half horse. Half man, half horse. Yeah. To me all day, every day. Like, my sister calls this every time we talk about it. She's like, I already know. Centaur, centaur, centaur. It's like, I didn't even realize that I needed that clear. But the way that she, like, highlights it, I'm like, oh, wow, I really went in. But I'm a sucker for a shifter. Or, like, the in-between. Like, half man. I mean, I want you to be a man. But then when you shift, I want you to be half man, half horse. There's always a piece of an animal. Yeah, I think um, doesn't Gina Showalter have one like a centaur? Ser- I don't know, but I need to look at it. I know PC Gina, has, yeah. uh, she introduced me to the centaur world, and that's how I got hooked on it with the PC <laughs> cast. That bitch had me one team, uh, this centaur and its whole fleet of uh, soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm down with the uh, with the wolves. I got it. That's my thing. You know, you yeah. got it in your books. I'm just like, mm-hmm. yes, I want a wolf shifter any day, every day. Okay, so what's your favorite naughty word? Are you into cocks and the pussies? I think I like like cock dick is probably like a, the uh, there's like one word that I just I don't know why I've always just been like with is nipple. I don't know why nipple bothers me so much but it does and it's and it's just weird even like male nipple it's just that word nipple I, yeah. I, I, yeah it's just a word i always trip over for some reason i love your word choice in your books i'm like fuck yeah <laughs> last question in our rapid fire who do you identify with um from your characters uh who would you say is your alter ego um, I would probably say my alter ego is likely to be uh, probably a cross between Cass and Kieran. Like I would, I feel like Kieran, I'm probably most like in real life a little bit because he has a very dry type of sense of humor at times. And he's always kind of, you know, sitting back and watching. Um, I, so I feel like it'd be a cross between them, but probably mostly Kieran. We love him too. Hmm. Yeah, we do. All right. Now let's get into the book a little bit more. Let's go behind the scenes. What sparked A Fire in the Flesh? Was it always part of your grand vision for the Blood Ash series? Well, originally I hadn't planned to tell like Sarah and Ash's story. Um, but once I was getting to that part of the series where I started to have to do all the backstory of like, how did we get here? You know, I knew that there was going to be things that like even Cass didn't know about who the gods were and all that stuff. I started to think that, you know, instead of doing like these big info dumps, right, I I would show instead of telling the readers um, the backstory. I planned for it to be like three books, but once I started writing A a Fire in the Flesh, I realized I couldn't finish it all in just one last book. For, For Sierra, the things that she's experienced, for that to be addressed in a way that I feel comfortable with and also um to flesh out certain developments that came at the end of the book but also you know to be able to get other parts of the story like really on the page mm-hmm. i knew that i had to then have it as a, a a fourth book so that's how it all got kind of got started for this series are you going to like the next book are you going to combine both the from blood and ash and the fire in the flesh or are we going to see another book from each of those and then they, it all comes together. So there is Born of Blood and Ash, which is coming out, um, you know, in the, the first half of um, uh, 2024. I expect there to be a slight change in that publication. 
um, mainly because production time, making sure like, you know, everything has time to go through like a lot of edits because I'm still working on that book because the last book is been it had this hasn't been announced yet so i don't even know when this is going live i'm sure the publisher would be like jesus Christ, exclusive so, so yeah and it's not gonna it's not gonna be a huge it's not gonna be a huge shift it's just gonna be a, like a, a couple weeks of that it's just that because i never this so you want to have the behind the scenes so because i never planned to have this as four books i had to then work into my schedule writing an entire book that was never on my schedule that I hadn't really like I like I knew how that series ended but I then had to take that last half that would have been really rushed and then make that into a full book which I had Mm -hmm. plenty of reason and opportunity to do that but you have to like when you don't go into writing something with that in your mind it can be very difficult to pivot (laughs) basically Mm -hmm. and be like okay let me make sure I do this and so, you know, I, my schedule got all kinds of out of whack. And the final book in that series, Born of Blood Nash, is a very difficult book because you have obviously things that Sarah has to deal with. You have all these key points, right, that you have to know for Blood and Ash. Like, why is, why isn't Sarah known? Um, you know, why did she choose that? Um, what is going on with Satora and Satora's soul. Um, what the hell, where did Callum fuck off to? You know, like kind of thing. Yeah. Like there's like, so you have all these things, but then you have kind of like these emotional underbeats. Also, there are some pretty big things that happen in this book. Like you find out basically like why the gods are, you know, don't enter the mortal realm anymore. And, you know, what happened with that, that they pulled back a little bit because, you know, and it's, and it's, you know, part of the scene, that's that part of the book is, you know, at one point kind of really badass writing. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is, there is a, a flip side to that, which is the one thing that is kind of explored. And I'm trying to like, how I say this without like giving away spoilers for that, but it's like, you, I think one of the things that's it's explored in these books is as, like with Colas, for example, a villain always thinks they're the hero, right? Mm-hmm. But the hero is never 100% good either, right? Nobody nobody is 100% good. And you know how you always hear that saying, um, well, good people are capable of terrible things and bad people yeah. are capable of good things. And you see a bit of that and you, it's because, you know, it's like the line between justice and vengeance is very thin. And what happens when you topple over that line? And so, it, so there's some, some very obvious, serious moments in that, that, you know, yeah. a bit to write to make sure you got it right. But then of course, there's all the other stuff. There's humor, there's the sexy times, but so there would be a little bit of a, a change in the date but not a huge one so that's the final flesh and fire book um then the next blood and ash book the primal of blood and bone you will see sierra and ash obviously would be that's when the series merged together and, and they kind of merged together a little bit in a you know at the end of the war to queens and in a soul because you have nick toss coming over um but like yeah. obviously ash was like i know you want to go kick some ass but you know we're gonna fuck first. <laughs> That's what I mean. So you like send Nick Toss. <laughs> yeah. Jennifer, Jennifer, I have I pick up on your breadcrumbs and I don't know if I should say it right now on the podcast because if I'm right, I don't want to be a spoiler. So if I say it like five minutes, I just want Okay. Okay. Please <laughs> exactly. okay, don't yeah. add, but yeah. I want to tell you what I think is gonna happen. Um I think <laughs> Sartora's soul, I think it gets reincarnated into Poppy. I think that's who Poppy is. I will say a lot of, you know, I've seen people mentioning that theory. I've seen that theory being tossed around. I've seen other theories. I'm kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> um, I know I've seen some people who thought maybe it was Millie. Um, Millie mm. sent, um, the but fact, you know, not a- it was the fact what got me when I re- when it like when I thought it clicked because I can't tell if you're telling me it is or it isn't, but it was when her soul was leaving um, Sarah's and going into the diamond, and she's like, "We will meet again." And then I think about what a like 
not the last, but what I want to say, the guild of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm struggling, but the guild of the crown of the other bones. Yeah. Yes. When she like comes into her full power and she screams the name Seraphia and then I'm like, they see each other again. And the fact that I, I don't know, I have a feeling that it's probably, but don't tell me, but that's what I think. And I also think Sarah's pregnant. Well, and so I think who you might be thinking of is the war to queens when she yells her name. But yes. she does see Sarah for the first time. Right. When she sees Sarah's eyes, basically. Yes. Mm-hmm. In the yes. crown of the bones. Yeah. And yes. so, yes. You know, but the, I will say this. There is a very obvious, strong connection between Sarah, Poppy, and Millicent. They are all One the person who love grandchildren. Millicent. You know? Yeah. So uh, these are Sarah's grandchildren. And so there, but there's, you know, a strong connection in, in a lot of ways to them. But I will say what I always say. You will see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited either way. If I'm wrong, I would be happy about that because who doesn't love a surprise? Like, I don't, if I know it, great. Cause I'll be like, yeah. Mm-hmm. But if I don't, I'll be like, yes, you gave me that choice. Either way, I'm going to be happy. You know, I think I, I, I think I've dropped, I mean, I feel like I have dropped a lot of clues. <laughs> like I have dropped a lot of huge, I won't even say so much bread com- crumbs. Mm-hmm. I will drop entire slices of bread. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, you know, and so I think that, th- that I think some people might not be entirely surprised about something, but I do think people are going to be very surprised about some other things. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, <laughs> okay, okay. You, you said a lot, you it's know, right. we'll take those slices of bread. Okay. And you did mention that they had to have a fuck fest. Now, you know, cocktails and clutter, I got to get into that just a tad. Okay. Because to me, Ash was really pulling out that dumb, but <laughs> Sarah did say, hey, I will submit, you know, just because I don't, I don't have to, but I'm going to because this is what I want. So use those tendrils, tie me up, mm-hmm. do what you're going to do, you know, fuck my pussy in the ass, you know, <laughs> just give it to me. So you've got this incredible story, story building. You've got the spice. you got the steam. How do you put it all together? There are many times that I will write like a really hot scene or something or like an action scene. But then I realize, okay, wait a minute. This may be a weird time to be having sex. Like, you know, like, and I, you know, where it's kind of like, would you really be doing that right now? (laughs) Like, you know, kind of thing. And so I've had to some, you know, sometimes I have to go and and rearrange the scenes because it's, it just doesn't flow right. It doesn't feel right. So it's something that you kind of just learn to kind of do as you're writing that you you catch that this doesn't feel right to have them mm-hmm. doing this here and the thing with like Sierra, she has an issue with control like she wants to feel like she's in control and that was something she obviously had taken from her you know in a fire in the flesh but before that in a light in the flame is that was a big thing for her that she was willing to give that control over to ash because she trusted him and that was a huge thing where if she, you know, it's, you know, you do see that a lot of times in real life, like Dom and submiss- submissive relationships yes. is usually the person who's submissive outside of that bedroom. They are usually the very dominant personality and they're mm-hmm. the ones who is like, they're the ones pulling the strings often <laughs> behind everything. Right. But it's in, in that situation because they trust whomever they're with that mm-hmm. they can hand that over. Yeah, and create the safe space, right? And he was able to do that for her. So she felt comfortable enough to like relinquish that and let him take over because she wanted it too. How did you feel writing that? Because you, you've you written sex scenes before, but this was like... Yeah, the, 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 you talking about like the shadow daddy scene? Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, I feel like when you've written a lot of books, and you've written a lot of sex scenes you you sometimes have to be like okay like how am I even going to get myself still interested in writing this because there is only so many ways that you can write a sex scene but you eventually do feel like you run out right (laughs) because you're kind of like well if I've written this I have to write it differently I want to make sure it's still exciting for the reader 
And I do find that a lot of readers, and I can be one of them myself, sometimes will lose interest in the series, like once the characters actually do get together, because they feel like, oh, the conflict's gone, the tension's gone. Um, and, you know, as an author, it becomes your job to be like, no, the tension's still there. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the conflict is just different. But like, I thought like, you know, every time that I originally written, you know, Ash with the, the shadowy, shadowy tendras, um, I kind of thought, well, wait a minute. Cause when I first started writing that, I don't think I had in my head, I was going to do that, but it's like things kind of fall into place. They work out because I was, you know, with the references of Sarah being like, whatever she would feel that brushy against her, it would never hurt her. But if it brushed it against somebody else, it just yeah. obliterates them. Yeah. And I think that's where it kind of started from. And then I was like, oh, well, wait a minute. He could probably use these because it all the primal mist is or the ether is an extension of the primal's will. So it's so mm -hmm. I was like, oh well, well, you know, if I had that, I'd probably do it too. <laughs> that would be like I, you know you could do How that. Do you use those? How do you use those is that the same kind of thought process you had for the lake scene? Because as a reader, the buildup that you created for the lake scene was memorable from book one to book two to book three i've read that scene probably three times now like the first time that i read it i went right back to the beginning and read it again like right after it was the way you talked about the way he bit his lip and she looked at him it was the banter it was the teasing it was uh, the way he pulled her curls that buildup was the best buildup i've ever experienced in a book scene and to this day, it's the most memorable intimacy. And they didn't even fuck. So the yeah. fact that you had me reading it so many times, the fact that you were so descriptive in the way that we sized people up and were attracted mm -hmm. to them. And then also, it was the first time that Ash and Sarah were able to strip away their responsibilities and just be in that moment and be themselves did you also find yourself discovering that moment just like the readers and were you just as turned on as the readers when you wrote it because it's really the one of the best scenes i've ever read well i think that like that was like one of the first scenes i wrote for that book before i wrote anything else like that oh. was one of the scenes that always came to me like when i was writing a story that was like their meat like in their mind that was originally was going to be like the like initial like you know uh thing that just always came to me was that scene and so i had started with that originally and then of course it got you know a bit changed once i started writing going forward with it but you know i think when you have the characters meet for the first time it's so important because <laughs> there's mm -hmm. like there has to be instant something whether it's instant attraction instant lust instant um hate curiosity instant, yeah curiosity there has to be something and i always knew that lake was going to be important i always knew that you know it was going to come eventually that this would be where she would ask to go when it was her time to die basically and so i knew that this lake would always play the, this reoccurring theme and i also knew that he had been to that lake many many times in the past because he knew that was what she called her lake um and so it was i kind of went in writing it that way um yeah. was you know was what was basically in the back of my head but it was one of my favorite scenes to write like you know because I, I like the banter between them in yes. that scene because and also it, it's looking back at it I feel like as the reader and as me, it's like she's over here just mouth and off like no one's business, having no idea that, mm -hmm. you know, who he is. <laughs> and, you know, and it, that was a part that also I enjoyed. But yeah, they were able to be who they are. And the one thing that I, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think you may have seen it a little bit in the light of the flame towards the end and then a bit in the fire in the flesh but you will see it in born a blood and ash where you know ash is very different right outside of the shadowlands versus yes. him in the shadowlands but you start seeing that personality with sira come back because of how he was originally and that's something that you know in his mind like he feels safe to be able to be more um relaxed so, yeah. yeah and you right. know, not feel like everything is so serious all the time kind of thing where um you're, you're you're able to see that more 
And you know, the funny thing is, it's like, I, I don't know about other authors. I do know some of that I do know, you know, we're friends with. And for me, we always get asked like a lot of times, does the book, like the hot scenes, do they like turn us on um, as we're writing them? And I think they probably do when we think about them. But once we sit down to write them, no, because it's okay. so technical at that point. Because yeah. it is, they are sex scenes. Be, in the in the beginning for me, they weren't that hard to write because I had just started writing them. Now that I've written so many of them, they are significantly harder to write because it's like, I again, I'm like, I have to make it different. I have to make it like, that's just not copy and paste, basically. Mm -hmm. um, it feels that way, you know? And so it, it, it's very technical because it's like, you know, you got to make sure that, wait a minute, like, did he just get three hands? Like how, how that <laughs> <laughs> and now with Ash, possibly it might not be a hand, but it could be something else that could be helping out. But it becomes, it's very technical upon writing it because you're having to like, it has to make sense. And so they are as difficult sometimes as like a, a battle scene, right? Because it's still, again, very choreographed where it's like, there's so much bodily action that you have to trans, you know, communicate onto the page to in a way that's not like repetitive or or functionary yeah like, yeah right. yeah 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 absolutely i was gonna comment real quick when you were saying that you know ash was able to be not so serious and feel safe and vulnerable i saw that as well when you know the lead up to when they thought uh, sarah was dying and he was able to be more relaxed you know with the whole group he was able to actually accept yeah. hugs and and things like that which is something that was so foreign to him even though he had a connection because those were his peeps he still yeah. you know kept them at a distance and you were able to write and craft that so beautifully that he was able to like let his walls down and that touched me so much and I'm glad like I'm glad that was something that was communicated because like I was, I was hoping people noticed that, that as the books progressed, the way he interacted with the other characters started to change. And, and I was hoping that that was something that was being picked up on where, you know, like, but because even I, I sometimes likely miss what is on the page just because I'm focused on something else in the book. But that was something that I was kind of purposely steering was just noticing these changes and noticing where you know, like, and there, uh, this would be like a, a little spoiler for the next book. It's not a huge spoiler. I don't even consider this a spoiler, but it's something along the theme is, you know, like there is no furniture in like his um, office. Um, now, you know, he, yeah, people, yeah. And then he, there's an anti-chamber that's um, mm -hmm. affected through the back of the bathing chamber. And you get to see that more. Um, that's just more of like a meeting space, right? In the office, um, you know, one of the serious thing in this book, she's like, you need knickknacks. And he's like, knickknacks, like, what are you talking about? He's like, you need something on these shelves. Like, and like, cause it's, and every time she goes past like the, the marble pedestal, she's like, there needs to be something on this fucking pedestal. Like, why is it? Here? <laughs> and so it becomes a thing of hers, but you do see furniture being moved in to totally. the office because yeah. people are actually spending time in there. Yes. And it, so that was something that, you know, I really enjoyed showing in this book where, because to me, that was like as big as saying in a way, like not obviously as big as I love you, but it was, it's a clear, like you're seeing a character arc happening, right? Mm -hmm. Where in you know, his size, it's not spoken. It's not, you know, anything like that. It's, you know, you're seeing these little tiny changes that, um, you know, that the character is now allowing Ash, he, you know, Ash is way more considerate of others than he likes to acknowledge. Ash, I feel like, is very sacrificial. Like, he will, you know, he has sa he sacrificed a lot for Sarah before he even really held a conversation yeah. with her. Yeah. Uh, so he he's always kind of been the one who thinks of the realm, right? Um, and a lot of that is because his father was the true primal life and those mm. embers were originally in him. And so he has that, even though he's a primal death now, he ha still innately has that, he feels like he feels death differently. Like he sees Sarah, <laughs> like, kind of like, oh, that's yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. my goodness. You know, she's just like, you know, she's very different than him. And, and I think they make a good match for that because he is kind of, and that's the reason why in Blood and Ash, she isn't awake. 
Mm-hmm. And he, it's him who's waking up and kind of scoping things out and being like, oh dear, like how bad is this going to be when she wakes up? Because mm-hmm. it, in the next book, you will see how exactly bad it can be <laughs> when you yeah. a primal of life or death. <laughs> and so, I mean, it's because they're very, very, they are the most, even newly ascended, they are the most powerful primals. And keep in mind that's before there was a primal both. So I mean, mm-hmm. it, and you see what they are capable of in this book. It kind of gives you a hint of, you know, again. And I think there will be breadcrumbs again dropped about certain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love trying to figure it out. So I love that you're you're giving us exactly what we want. Okay, so let's celebrate your kick-ass heroines. You throw in stereotypes out the fucking window with full figure. <laughs> powerful women who are comfortable in their sexuality. What's the motivation behind representing a broader spectrum of women and how you empowered it in, in your narratives? You know, I think about for me, it's like when I was younger, even though these books are not for young adults, but I'm going to go back to that when I was a teenager and I don't know what your age of you two are, but like I grew up in the era of what they used to call, I think, heroin chick, which was Kate Moss era, right? Yeah. The super thin like in yes some people are naturally that thin but that it was an era of when you could tell when someone wasn't naturally that thin <laughs> like you could yes. unfortunately you could see it but I grew up like there was never like I, I mean I, it's like not even like average right like not even an average sized woman which in America and in a lot of places is I think several years ago it was like a size 14 or 16 I'm sure it's probably larger now but that was like that's the average person and you didn't even have anyone two sizes even less than that like you know what I mean like it was it was one of my examples I always give is if you're watching a damn commercial about paper fucking towels (laughs) you will have a woman who is extremely fit extremely attractive dress in a way that I am never dressed when I'm using a fucking paper towel in my house. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and then just like the most average dude for the husband, like non-attractive, but normal, right? Just a yeah. towel. But I'm like, but you, we can't even get that in a damn bounty paper towel commercial. Like, yeah. it, but, I mean, when you start like paying attention to that, like when you start like really like, come on, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. why does it always happen? But it's also, it's, it's, it's the colors, the skin, diversity, gender, yeah. you know, like in all those ways. But like, I think back when I was a teen and kind of like, what if there was a Buffy, for example, <laughs> who just wasn't. And no, no shade against either Buffy's that there were, but looked more like me or more like most people. <laughs> like, right. And because I think that I would at least probably been kinder to myself maybe at that age. Cause you know how it is. You think you're, you're not thin enough, not pretty enough, not whatever. But then you look back at pictures of yourself 20 years ago and you're like, the fuck was that? Oh, like, oh, yeah. Like, to the, yeah, you look back and like, oh, good. Just walking out half naked all the time. Like, what was I thinking? Like, you know, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I'm not the type of person who, for body image issues, you can't put that entirely on media, right? It, it, right. Because that is, you know, coming from a psychology background, we are that does play a role, right? But it's also taking off all the responsibility of the people around you Mm -hmm. uh, and yourself. And, but also the fact that this is a generational thing, right? Um, So I think if I saw that, it probably would have made me feel about myself differently. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's the truth because you just see how people respond to both Poppy and Sarah and just like, oh my gosh, like they're not real thin. They're not, you know, somebody who just has this almost unattainable body shape unless they are, you know, doing certain things. And then they could be extremely healthy things, right? I feel like it's because they're seeing that. And I I, and I think of myself, which is, I would have loved to have had that, like a Buffy that looked like that or any other, a fucking person with a, a pack of paper towels. In your book. And your books show that they are deserving of love. They are deserving of desire. They are deserving of being sought after. And I find that very comforting as a woman that is a little bit fuller. You know what I yeah. mean? So 
Um, well, because you are like that's the thing it's like but yes. you're only ever shown in media the opposite of that mm -hmm. but obviously it's not the case and you know i do think we are getting better right i mean i think media is a little maybe not actually we were and, and now yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, wait a minute yep we went yep. through a lot of Burn it. Change, and now we're back yeah. to the 90s which is so fucking wild but yeah yeah wild. and the fact that kirby then Whatever you are, and beautiful, and it's accessible, yes. and it's desirable. It's the exactly. welcome that I think your books are conveyed. Absolutely. I did want to ask you really quick about your journey with retinous pigmentosa, um, mm -hmm. because I know that's a condition that you have. And speaking of diversity and characters who have different things that they're dealing with, how do you think that has influenced your writing? I was diagnosed with that in elementary school, which, you know, that that means you, you're just fucked. <laughs> like you're, you're near sighted and far sighted. You just need glasses yeah. all the time. You're supposed to have mm -hmm. them. But I have like this thing where I do not like anybody getting near my eyes and I do not like eye drops. I do not like them. And so a lot of people don't realize this. You don't have to have your eyes dilated when you go to eye doctor. Um, but lots of times if you're getting glasses, they don't want to dilate your eyes because they need your eyes to be functioning for them to get your prescription, right? However, mm -hmm. I am not here to say don't do that. <laughs> I went for a very long time without them ever dilating my eyes because I just, I, I don't like, I don't like anything coming close to my eye. And um, so it was just one year. I, I want to say it was right after Christmas. It was in my early thirties and I was going to get, um, I had to go to the eye doctor and I was like, fuck it. Yeah, let's, let's do it. You know, I don't know. It's just weird. And I did it. And as soon as the doctor looked into my eyes, he, I just remember this, he sat back and he was like, does anybody in your family have, um, you know, at that point he said, um, early onset macular degeneration, which is what your eyes normally do when you get earlier, but it can happen when you're younger. Mm -hmm. And I was like, not that I know of. And then, you know, he was like, there's something, you know, wrong with your retinas. And he then referred me to a retina specialist. And that's when they, so you have to go to a special doctor for that because they have to do all of these insane tests um, where they put this like IV into your blood that goes into your eyes and it changes, it changes your vision <laughs> for like seconds so your vision goes from like normal to like bluish green and then red and i remember the first time i had that done uh i was <laughs> god this poor guy probably thought i was insane because i was like oh this must be like what bloodlust feels like because everything <laughs> had a crimson sheen to it like, <laughs> like, like, the red came out. Out. like what? <laughs> and i was like never mind <laughs> like but it was, it was you know because it was changing the way i the colors, like I was seeing everything blue, the blue tint and the green tint it was very weird. But that's when they realized it was, you know, everybody pronounces it differently. I say retinosis pigmentosa, but I also just call it RP. And that's just a name for a group of genetic disorders that causes a deterioration in vision that can be gradual or very fast. Um, you're born with it. And because I never, you know, allowed my eyes to be dilated when I was older which is where they tend to actually start seeing it um i was never diagnosed that i was always diagnosed with something completely different but mm. that makes you more prone to cataracts and edemas in your eyes so that's where your eyes start swelling you can't see it but it's behind the eyes like you're like it'll push basically against the, pu the pupil at times surprisingly they always like this should be very painful. And I had like a very bad case of that and had no idea. My eyes did not hurt. So I'm very lucky because my progression has been slow. You know, I, I can no longer drive. I'm, you know, I haven't gone and gotten the official, like, you know, legally blind, but I'm, you know, my field of vision is so restricted now that I've gotten like the unofficial at the doctor. They must notify the DMV or something. Because you can't get a license. <laughs> like, so, yeah, I know. I know what uh, that's like. Yeah. yeah. I, had, I just have to drive my sister around. She had epilepsy constant. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, well, she couldn't drive. Yeah. For yeah, one of my long friends time. had that when we were teenagers. Yeah, and, she, and they were like, if she has X amount of seizures, it'd be fine. But it was like, if you have one more, 
yep. we're taking the license. And, yep. um, you know, but you understand because it's like, and I stopped driving long before my vision got this bad because I started to realize that I had been overcompensating for vision loss without realizing mm. I would start turning my head to look at things, even though I should have been able to see that. And I realized at that point that, oh my God, like if I'm driving, if an animal or a child runs out in front of me, I'm not going to see him in time to stop. And, and so that's when I knew that was several years ago. And, um, but it has affected my writing because I, I don't know if you guys noticed this on today, you see me messing with the light because it hurts my eyes. So oh, yeah. you know, I, that's why I'm turning down the light and trying to find it. I'll have days where it's like my eyes will just burn and burn and burn and that's the cataract but they don't want to remove the cataracts until they become extremely you know interfering with the daily life because the cataracts actually protect the retina from sunlight basically what happens is you every time you go to sleep and wake up your cells of your retina die off and that's what's causing it so but sun light exposure can quicken it so i'm very lucky though in the sense that my vision is nowhere as bad as it is for people my age but it has started to affect my um my writing and you know i wrote the harbinger series um that trinity had the same eye disease as me because i really didn't even know up until that point you know we think of the blind and the seeing and maybe you have to wear glasses right we don't really realize that there are all these other diseases so i thought well this would be i think having a character because one thing i feel like once you you don't want that to be the sum of who you are yeah you know and Yeah. And it's like, this is who I am. And I want to show that. And it's the same thing with like Sarah, for example, with her dealing with anxiety and depression. I've obviously had personal experience with that, but also working in the field of psychology. It's like, that's not all of that and who I am. Like that's, you know what I mean? Like, and I Mm -hmm. want, I don't think we see that still to this day often where you have characters that are in romance that have mental health struggles. You're starting to see, I think a bit more now of like autism and things like that. Like, I think we're starting to see more books showing that, but it's still like, I just, if you think about back, like maybe five years ago, like, can you think of a book where someone had depression or anxiety? Mm-hmm. That it was pretty significant where it was a romance with a happy ending. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, I'm a firm believer of if the universe kind of doesn't give you enough of something, it gives mm-hmm. you so much more of something else. And just hearing your experience with this, I feel like that explains your detail to your world building, the way a location looks, the way that Cass and Poppy traveled. And I just think that you have found a way to compensate it in a way that highlights you as an author and how you're able to bring the readers in. It just makes me think just how wonderful you are. Like your Amazon deals, like what's next for you? Well, in this world has seen your talent and said, fuck yeah, this is an amazing story. I love your heroines. And we want this story on the big screen. So tell us a little bit more about that if you can. You know, and I think honestly, like when I write, I have to be able to visualize it. Like I'm one of those people that can see what's because, you know, how we all apparently just all discovered a couple like a year or so ago that not everybody sees things in our mind, which I always knew. However, I'm shocked every time I see an author who does not visualize, which because I'm like, how the fuck do you write then? Because to me, it's like... Right. Do that. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, and I think honestly, that's what helps me visualize because I think, you know, mm-hmm. maybe subconsciously or like in a way that's so important to like describe in detail, like what I'm seeing, like, you know, and, or what I'm trying to get, cause I want, cause for me, I have to be able to visualize it. Like I have to, it needs to play in my head, like a movie. And, you know, and I want that for the readers that it plays, if they have that, that it plays in their heads. Um, so, I mean, the Blood and Ash series um, has been optioned by Amazon Studios. Uh, it, I, I think they call it a TV series. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they call that because it's, it's streaming, but we're going to call it a TV series. Let's <laughs> do it. I like it. I like Whatever it. Whatever you want to call it, we just want to see it. And and the good news is, is that, um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of movement on certain fronts because of the strikes that we've had, which I 100% fully supported yeah. the writers and the actors. Uh, the good news during that is that Amazon, um, when you have a contract, it's for a, 
of time and they have to either have taken steps towards getting it into production for them to renew it they, or they have to pay you more or due to extenuating circumstances, they can pause the contract saying we're pausing the contract now. And that means this time is not continuing, right? When we're not able to do anything. So they did do that twice during it. So that's a good sign that shows that that they were still interested and intending to do it. You know, and so I was relieved whenever we got those emails because I was like, because I was waiting for the opposite because unfortunately, I don't know if you guys remember when this happened beforehand and I think it was like 2008, it was like the 2000s where there was a very long strike and yeah. that a lot of extremely popular TV shows were canceled. We've already seen that now, like with Shadow and Bone, for example. It was yeah. that is I just do not understand out of everyone that you could have picked. Like, even if you didn't watch it, it's like that was rated very high. I love <laughs> that. Show. Of, yeah. And the, but we're we're and you're seeing that with other um networks where shows have are being canceled and um, that's an unfortunate thing. So I mean, I'm hoping that we make it past this period of time. Um, but it's you know, things are rough right now. So I mean who knows but so far like they have been very confident in making it the producing team it's a company called chaotic good and they're amazing like i feel like they know more about the books or just as much as i do when i talk to them i was like oh my god <laughs> they, they and, and they're also like little lurkers they work online a lot. So they're in a lot of like reader groups and, a lot of, but, and I'm not the only one they work on. Like they, they are behind some of the, the biggest franchises, but, and it was just something that I learned that they do pay attention to what readers are saying. Um, and that's good. Like, and they're not doing it to be creepy. They're doing it to be like, okay, we want to make sure we do this justice. Right. Yeah. And we've all seen adaptations where it's like, why did you make that choice? Like of all the things, cause here's the thing. Some mm -hmm. things are going to change, right? You don't want to change like one of the things that makes, you know, like people really love, right? Because yeah. that, then you're just shooting yourself in the foot out the gate. The showrunner, um, she's she's worked with the boys and um, several other of the properties. She has a lot of experience. I got to read like her plans um, and they were great. So I'm hoping that it continues. So, I mean, in... I know Amazon is very focused on fantasy and very focused on um, romance right now because it was something that they had mentioned to me originally was that, you know, they realized they had a gap there in their lineup mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they did not have. Because that was also before they had the Ginny Han series that they did not have much romance centric stuff that actually appealed to romance and people who like you know, fighting scenes, like you would, they would consider certain masculine things. I know they're actively still wanting that. So, well, congratulations to even be on their radar for them to even try to conceptualize something so intricate and so amazing and such a fan favorite is a win already for you. And I just feel like regardless of how it shakes out, your books, just serve its purpose and does what it's intended to do. So we love you. You always have a home at Cocktails and Cliterature. We absolutely adore you. And that wraps up another episode of Cocktails and Cliterature, where things got steamy and conversations got spicy. If you enjoyed our wild book reviews, author interviews, and irresistible cocktails and wines we sipped on, make sure to subscribe, download, and rate our podcast wherever you listen. Stay connected with us on Instagram and Facebook at Cocktails and Cliterature for all the latest updates, behind the scenes fun, and more. And if you'd like to support the show, consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page. Your support helps us keep the naughty conversation flowing. Thanks for joining us on this thrilling journey. And hey, if the world asks you why you're blushing, tell them you're listening to Cocktails and Cliterature, the podcast that brings the heat one smutty chapter at a time. <laughs>